Change Your Life Through Love by Stella Terrell Mann. Part 3. How to Work with the Law of Love. Chapter 8. To Restore and Maintain Health. The farther we go in our studies of the spiritual laws, the more we shall find the tremendous part our feelings play in our lives. This is because our feelings set forces into motion by filling our thoughts and acts with power. Feelings go deeper than reason. Feelings of love and of hate are some of the strongest known to man. Each of these produce after their kind. Love is the greatest healing agent yet discovered. More people are sick from lack of love in their lives than from all other causes put together. God, the spirit of love, is the power which created and maintains the life of earth. Certainly, then, he is the power which can heal. A careful study of the Bible and revelations to my own consciousness convinced me that there is no hope of eternal life for the individual outside love, and that this love must be expressed by the individual. Since love is the extreme desire for the welfare of mankind, we see that God is love, and He can do no more for man than love Him, and be no more to man than the fountain of love. Therefore, God Himself cannot save us if we reject love and His plan for all men. God's part has been done to the point where we must intelligently and willingly cooperate. Until we do that, God can go no farther in plans for us. For we have free will. This Jesus preached, and we must believe it if we are to restore our health through love. In fact, we must eventually believe it if we are to continue in evolution and eternal life. Through psychiatry, psychology, psychoanalysis, and psychosomatic medicine, the world is rapidly becoming convinced of the truth of Jesus' teachings concerning the spiritual laws as they affect our mental spiritual, and physical health. Summed up, we must love or suffer not only unto death, I am convinced, but to outer darkness. To restore health, we must love God, the essence of all good. If we had enough love, we could be instantly healed. We could close our hospitals for the sick, would take up their beds and walk. There would be no accidents, for we would love ourselves, our neighbor, and the progressive good of all men so much that we would prevent them. For one quick example, we have discovered that most automobile accidents caused by reckless driving are due to the emotions of the driver who hates himself and the world and is unconsciously trying to wreak vengeance on himself and others. Industry has learned to look into the emotional life of the employee who meets with accidents. The failing employee often is one who is having troubles with love. Germs, always present on earth, could not harm us if we vibrated at the high frequency of desire to live and serve which Jesus knew. For example, Dr. Harold G. Wolfe, Associate Professor of Medicine, Cornell University Medical College, announced recently that anger opens the way to the common cold. He explained how in anger, the germs already present in the nasal tract are enabled 
to get hold and start infection. The same is true of fear of danger. He said, if we loved God, ourselves, and our fellow men enough, we'd overcome all worries and really live. We would lift our minds above the level of microbes and germs. If we knew as much about the spiritual laws as Jesus knew, we could heal every disease known to man and do so without having first to learn the nature of the disease itself. If we knew those laws, we'd know that love, the white-hot desire for all good, is the highest law, which other laws challenge in vain. The intelligence that created microbes and germs created also the human machine, loves it, and knows what it needs to maintain it in perfect running order. That intelligence is available to all who ask its guidance. But it does not interfere with man's own free will about such matters as germs or bodily health. There is a love that has the welfare of human beings at heart. Within man, there dwells the very spirit of God, or that same love which is so almighty, so all-seeing, and so all-caring, that it is aware of even the fall of a sparrow. Again, there is a purpose in man's being on earth, which is far more important to God, the Creator, than to man, the created. The love and intelligence which first desired and then created the beginnings of man, placing him on earth for a purpose, have led him thus far on his way. They are available to guide all who believe in and ask for such guidance. But God so loved man that he gave him free will. And with that free will, man has the choice of working with love, God's plan for man, or of refusing to do so. We get right back to where we started from, the two commandments of love. There is no hope for man outside of them. Love or suffer. Recently, Dr. Edward Weiss of Temple University Medical School announced that chronic victims of muscular aches and pains without organic ailments were probably suffering from a smoldering grudge against someone close to them. This is a fact to which every faith healer can testify. We have articulated in it the phrase, Who is the matter with you? A woman who suffered sudden attacks of neuritis came to me for help. She had such pains up her arms and in the side of her neck that she could not drive her car, could hardly move her head. She then had to spend long hours resting under the infrared lamps. These attacks were becoming more frequent, lasting longer and increasing in severity. We traced them to those times when her daughter-in-law came to dinner. She was sure that woman was ruining her son's life and had tricked him into marriage, though the son seemed to be happy indeed. The woman suffered so terribly, she was willing, she said, to do anything to be healed forever. But when I told her she'd have to stop her hard, harsh thoughts and feelings about her daughter-in-law, she was sure she could not do it. I then advised her to stay away from her son's wife, to avoid living a lie and pretending a love she did not feel. So she moved to another town. The neuritis attacks fell off to almost nothing. Convinced she was on the road to healing, she came back for help. That time I did not spare her but pointed out facts which her own history revealed. I told her that she was really furious with herself because she felt she had failed as a mother and her daughter-in-law had brought her son more happiness as a wife than she had been able to bring to him. Self-hatred often masks itself as love. The woman was brave and determined. She eventually righted her life and restored her health through love. 
but it began with herself. Jesus commanded us to love ourselves because self-hatred is a destroyer of health and life. It is impossible to love our brother while we are hating ourselves. It is equally impossible to love ourselves while hating our brother. For to hate our brother is to set a force into motion against ourselves. Hate creates after its kind. Another woman came to me for help, complaining that her prayer for perfect and radiant health had not been answered. She had been run down for years, she said, and was always tired, nervous, felt heavy, couldn't sleep, and worried about everything. She was only 52 years old, but appeared to be about 65. She was intelligent, a college graduate, wife of a professional man. He had heard me lecture and had taken her a copy of my book, Change Your Life Through Prayer, several months before, but she had not had time to read it. Yet she confessed that she spent several hours a day reading murder mysteries and other escape novels. What are you running from? I finally asked when all the evidence before me indicated that she was trying to hide and that her Lord was angry. After some very unvarnished questioning on my part, she began to tell me the true facts about her life. Then the trouble stood revealed. When the woman was about 25 years of age, her older brother, who had served as administrator of their father's estate, had cheated her out of part of her inheritance, a sum of less than $3,000. For 27 years thereafter, she had silently, but nonetheless bitterly, hated that brother. This hatred had ruined her complexion, her features, her figure, and her outlook on life all people, and most of all, herself. For secretly, in her heart, she knew she was wrong. The truth is that, though we may deceive the whole world, we cannot for an instant deceive our own soul. There is a judge within us who can neither be bribed nor swayed, silenced nor fooled. It is our own Christ mind, the very spirit of God within ourselves. This I explained to the woman and told her she had to forgive her brother or continue to suffer. I don't see why I should, she argued petulantly. He wronged me. Let let him ask my forgiveness. I shall not ask his. Then you cannot expect God to forgive you. It is the law the way things are made. Forgive your brother or God cannot heal you. Forgive me? Why? What have I done? I haven't done any wrong, she expostulated angrily. You have committed a greater crime against yourself and your brother than he has committed against you, I said and opened my Bible and read to her. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. From the first book of John, chapter 3, verse 15. And, if any man says, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. From the first book of John, chapter 4, verse 20. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? From the book of Matthew, chapter 7, verse 3. Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. From the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 44. By that time, she had put her hands to her face and asked me to stop. I asked her to read the whole book of Matthew when she got home and to read it several times before she came back for a conference. She returned to say she had discovered facts never before apparent to her, though she had been a church member all her life and still possessed her first Bible. Somehow I thought of my brother as the sinner, myself as sinned against, and I was put out with God for letting me be cheated. 
when she had righted her life, she said, I feel as if I had truly been born again, and just so she had. I feel that had Christ Jesus been dealing with that woman, he would have had only to look at her, and by his great love, his desire to promote her welfare, his deep compassion and forgiveness, he would have communicated to her that he understood. His glance would have conveyed to her that such a petty hatred was unworthy of a human being, persuading her silently to forget, forgive, and so be healed. I feel sure he would have had only to say, Wilt thou? And she, answering with her inner mind, shamed before his love, inspired by it, would have said, I will, and would have been instantly made whole. Perhaps Jesus would then have added, Go your way, sin no more, hate no more, lest a worse thing come upon you, now that you understand the law. When we reach the place that Jesus reached in his desire to promote the welfare of all men, we too can heal by our words and looks. But long before we have grown that perfect in love, we can heal ourselves and point out the way of restoring health to others. Love heals. We have but to set it into motion in our hearts, minds, and souls to prove it. If you have a health problem and wish to be restored to wholeness, start out by thinking, knowing that you can be healed. But unless you actually love health and desire to be healed, no power on earth or in heaven can make you entirely well. God himself does not usurp your free will. It is your right to be ill if you desire illness. In working with people who were trying to restore their health, I often have been amazed at how many of them did not recognize the fact that they had no desire to be healed. For example, a man who said he would give anything to be cured finally faced the truth that he did not want to be at all for fear he would again fail in his profession. Once, well, he would have to go back to work and he so feared the pain of repeated failure that he actually preferred illness to facing the test again. Another man who had long received the tender care of his loving family and had enjoyed his suffering because it was refining his soul kept on praying for health, being sure to add always, Lord, if this be good for my soul, and if it is thy will, then let me continue to suffer. And the Lord let him. The only positive words in his prayer were, let me continue to suffer. God had given him the free will to choose, and he received according to the choice he made. Many good, honest, and conscientious people suffer needlessly because they actually believe that by so doing they are serving God. They even feel that they have no right to pray for relief, saying, It is the will of God for me to suffer. It is my duty to suffer patiently and without complaint. These good people do not understand God's will or the law of love. If they did, they would know God's will is the welfare of mankind. Sickness is a sin, and the result of a sin which is contrary to love and to God's will for the welfare of man. It is merely the consequence of a man-made mistake. We have long since outgrown the haircloth shirt, the sackcloth and ashes, the burnt offering sacrifice as a way of worshiping God. We should discard all their mental equivalents, too. Much of our sickness is a hangover from the old idea of humiliating the flesh in order to improve the soul. Yet another reason why some are not healed in spite of their prayers, for health lies in their purpose in life. For example, 
Witness the case of an alcoholic with whom I worked and failed. The man finally admitted that once restored, he would go right back to the same old life he had lived before, which had brought on his illness in the first place. Alcoholics are desperately ill persons. The illness is basically a spiritual one, which first strikes the mind and then the body of its victim. That man's inner Christ consciousness was silently reminding him that he would have to change his whole life. And for some secret reason of his own, which he never could bring himself to confess, he was not willing to do so. Such people simply do not love life. Life to them is not the thrilling experience it should be. But a bewildering affair, burdensome and filled with care and fears. They see no way of changing it, once well, and so they are unconsciously desiring to die. The choice is always ours. Indifference to life and to others leads to dry rot in ourselves. Hate destroys and eats like an acid. Love alone creates, builds that which is good, fulfills the whole law of life on the physical, mental, and spiritual planes alike. If you have a health problem, the first thing to do is to rid your mind of all thoughts contrary to love for all people, including yourself and God. Then rid your mind of all thoughts contrary to the desire for the good of all. Finally, rid your life of all words, deeds, and beliefs contrary to the good of all. As soon as you wake up in the morning, say, I believe in the power of the living God within me to heal me and make me whole. Then consider your words. If you think of that power within you as being connected with the God mind, all there is that God mind can and will instruct you what to do and how to do it in order to be healed. Think of this power that is alive within you and intelligent as creating new cells, carrying off poisons, adjusting parts to the whole, as anything and everything necessary to make you well. Above all, remember this power is God's desire to promote your welfare to its highest good, to lead you to your ultimate growth. Then say, I now call on this power in faith and in love asking it to heal me and make me perfectly whole. Pause. Think about the meaning of your words. Then call. God, my Father, Spirit of all love, all good, please make me well and whole. Pause again and think about the meaning of your words. Remember, God is the Spirit of love which created the universe and man. Surely, it can create a new cell, reduce a fever, or adjust any part of the human mechanism to perfect working order. Moreover, it desires to do so because it loves you. Finally say, I am being healed through the power of love, and I am grateful that this is so. Then during the day, bring every thought word, act, and desire within the law of love. Many, many times during the day, repeat, I am being healed through the power of love, and I am grateful that this is so. This is not to impress God or the power of love that is doing the work. It is to impress your own consciousness, to keep you constantly aware of God's love for you. It is to keep your own mind up to that level of understanding and belief required for the healing to take place. If you change your high state of consciousness for a lower one of fear, doubt, impatience, or worry, that your healing will slow down or stop. At night, before you fall asleep, review your day. 
Have you given way to words of hate, anger, fear, or doubt? If so, forgive yourself and ask God to forgive you. Then, realize the past has been erased, vow to do better on the morrow, and go to sleep, feeling that love has erased every mark against you and that your sins, mistakes, will be remembered no more. Be sure to give thanks for your constant improvement in health, whether you can see the improvement or not. Improvement is there, long before your physical senses can become aware of it. If you are being attended by a physician, be sure to give him your fullest cooperation and gratitude. Have faith in his competence and in his earnest desire to help you. He deserves your praise, and he needs your free will cooperation if he is to serve you to the best of his ability. Be considerate. Don't be demanding, critical, or fearful. Your doctor is a child of God and a servant unto him. Anyone who will devote his life to helping suffering humanity, to abolishing pain and rebuilding bodies, is a servant of the Lord and worth our time, our prayers, our praise, and our money. To appreciate your physician's effort is in no way to relinquish your belief in the power of God's love to heal you. Far from it. It is rather to see your physician as a channel through which God can work. There are many levels of healing. Medicine is one of them. Be grateful for help from whatever source it may come. But remember, at all times, that the power of prayer still is the highest, best, and quickest means of healing. But if you have not yet learned how to work on that level, then work on another and thank God for all who help you. If you are in a hospital, you have an excellent opportunity to work with love in its effort to bring about your healing. You can expand waking hours silently, surrendering your heart to love, silently speaking, thinking, and listening with love. You can bless the institution which was organized by love and is maintained by it. Few hospitals ever pay their way. They are maintained by people who fervently care about their fellow men and desire to help them. I am so keenly aware of this fact that I cannot walk down a hospital corridor without feeling that impact of love. It always brings the tears to my eyes and, as the song has it, puts my heart on its knees just to know that there is so much love at work in the world. Remember, your nurses love their work, love to serve, or they wouldn't be there. Bless them. Be grateful for them. Let your gratitude and love show in your eyes, in your voice, and in your treatment of them. Remember them with a little gift, no matter how small, as an extra token of love. And do love them. It is this warm feeling about all life and people, this outpouring of gratitude and of love, this earnest desire to promote the welfare of others, to share life and love with them, to see the highest good in them, that heals and restores one's own health as well as one's soul. I have known and worked with a great many welfare and charity patients of one kind or another, and the sad truth is that almost without an exception, they were ungrateful, unhappy, demanding, and critical people. One woman who had been supported by the county and various state aides for more than 15 years had no good words to say to anyone nor about anyone. I once asked her by what right she demanded for her support the tax money of fine, struggling young people who were rearing a family, owed her nothing, and remained unknown to her. Why should strangers pay your bills? I demanded to know. The thought was so new to her that it required several days for her to think it over. It stirred up so much within her that 
Her pride eventually lifted her out of the state of blaming everyone except herself for the condition she had so long endured. Wherever you are when you are ill, let your mind often go out into space. Think of the beautiful world around you, of the perfect law and order in evidence everywhere. Realize you are not alone. God is not unaware of you. Think of the long history of the human race on earth. Remember that nothing ever has defeated it. Know that nothing can. In this way, still all your fears of the future, fears about your loved ones, fears about eternity. Stop all idle or active fears about death. Death is a door which opens to let us pass into a new way of life. Since all existence is a forward movement, then the life after death must necessarily be a better one than the one we lead here. And if you love, greatly desire, life then you can live on forever, no matter how many changes and adjustments you may have to make before you are able to let Christ consciousness rule in your life. Your illness is a temporary thing. Life is eternal. Your stay on earth is at most an ephemeral visit, but your existence is eternal if you so desire it. Think then on the eternal things, and you will find that through the law of love, the temporary ones are healed. Are you ill? My friend, love can heal you. Go back in memory to the happiest, the most loved-filled days of your life, back to childhood if necessary. Recapture the mood of those days when you felt secure and happy, knowing you were loved. Become again in thought and feeling as a little child. Relax and remember that you are a child of Father Time and Mother Nature. Then go a little higher in consciousness and realize there is a great sustaining power in the universe which loves you far more than you have ever loved anything in all your life. All we know of love is but a spark, a reflection of that love. That great love now holds you tenderly, knows what is happening to you, and will take care of you. When you feel too tired or too ill to think straight or to repeat affirmations, relax, smile to yourself, and feel the very love of God enfolding you, desiring all good for you. If the hour comes when you know you are to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, still you need fear no evil, for love is ever with you. Trust love to see you through this world and all worlds to come. Listen with love, my friend, and you will hear the voice of God saying, Come home, O oh weary child, come home. End of chapter. Let's head over to the next video. Before we do that, could you be so kind, hit that like button. Let me know you are here. Leave me a comment. And if you like what you hear or what you see on this channel, please do subscribe and share it with your friends. Let's go and learn how to develop your talent.